Good morning, members. So, if I could call the meeting to order um, and sort of check that we are uh, broadcasting. Thank you. So, members, uh, uh, welcome to our 2022 annual meeting of Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Authority. I am opening uh, the meeting in my capacity as Chief Fire Officer and Clerk to the Authority until the Chairman for the coming year is elected. A very warm welcome to new members of the Authority, which I think more will be said about later. This meeting is being held at our Fire and Police Shared Headquarters at Eastleigh. This meeting is also being recorded for broadcast on the Authority's website and will be available for repeated viewing. The press and members of the public are also permitted to film and broadcast this meeting. Those remaining at this meeting are consenting to being filmed and recorded, and to the possible use of those images and recording or broad for broadcast purposes. There was no scheduled fire alarm test today. In the event that the alarm sounds, please leave the building by the nearest and safest fire exits. Follow officers who will guide you to the fire muster point in the car park. And members, to remind you, uh, you have microphones on the table in front of you to amplify your voices and please push the button to speak and when you're not speaking please make sure you're switched off again. So members moving to item number one the election of chairman. Can I call for nominations to appoint a chairman until the annual general meeting of the authority in 2023 please? Any nominations? Councillor Hughes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor William Vaughan. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Okay, thank you. In which case, can I ask for a vote, please, uh, to elect Councillor William Vaughan to the uh, post of Chairman for the coming year? All those in favour? Okay, that's unanimous, in which case that makes my job nice and easy. Thank you, members. So hereby electing the Chairman to the Fire Authorities, Councillor William Vaughan, over to you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, members. I am honoured for your support. Bear with me. So, item two on the agenda. Again, before we go there, um, may I ask you, today is the fifth anniversary of the Grenfell Fire disaster. So, if I could ask you to stand and we'll have a, a minute's silence. <laughs> Okay, so item two on the agenda is election of a vice chairman. Um, do I have any nominations for the post of vice chairman? Chairman, may I nominate Councillor Hughes? Thank you. Any any more? I'll Seconded? Se I'll merely second that. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Hughes, are you all in agreement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Councillor Hughes, congratulations. 
you are the vice chairman. Technically, you should be sitting up here, but uh, I don't think we want any office movement now, do we? Are you happy to be where you are? You are elected, you don't have to. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, apologies for absence, item three. Katie. Uh, we have apologies from Councillor Manns, Councillor Kerno Ford, and Councillor Bundam. Okay. Um, I would also actually like to publicly welcome two of our new members, Councillor Zoe Huggins and Councillor Carol Corkery. Welcome. Um, the, the other absentees, you know, it's like when you get onto the committee, first off, you have plans already arranged, so it's not for lack of desire. So welcome, you two, to the, to the authority. Um, declaration of interest. Any? No? Okay. Uh, item five, the minutes of the authority meeting on the 12th of April. Does anyone have anything they want to raise on those minutes? No? Okay, I will sign them afterwards. Thank you. Item six, deputations. Any deputations? No. Nope. Item seven, members' developments. Councillor Huggins. Thank you. And as a new member, thank you for welcoming me. And I just wish to recognise the quality of the induction that I attended last week. Um, it, you know, it was really informative, but it was great to, to understand the drive and the passion behind it. So your values, your priorities, um, your safety plan, but obviously is uh, understanding the processes, so your assurance processes and your reporting. So I just wish to recognise that. So thank you. Any more members to run? Uh, Councillor Hughes. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, assuming I'm, I'm still the carbon reduction champion uh, after today, uh, I mean, but in that capacity, I met with Matt Robinson uh, last month for an update on where we are with the carbon reduction program, and uh, I'm reassured, I've never been in any doubt, to be for the record, I'm never in doubt, I'm reassured that the program that is, is set out last year is moving forward, and I've uh, been told by Matt that there will be a report coming to the authority, probably in October, outlining where we are how it's progressing and uh, the progress uh, from that moving forwards. So it's a well, very welcome meeting. Okay, thank you. Councillor Muller. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of people development, uh, I enjoy, very much enjoyed and found very informative the visit to Kingsclear uh, Fire Station. Um, two interesting topics arose out of that, one, one of which has been well publicised, the fire prevention issue, and also um, some development in terms of how we should be looking after the increase in female members of our, our crews. Um, improving work uh, on, on site for the increase of uh, female recruits was, is, is going to be a key focus. I look forward as well to attending the LGA Fire Leadership uh, Conference in Warwick in July, um, subject to, we've had other changes in Hampshire County Council, I now have a a rather confused diary, but subject to that, and also to getting involved with the cadets. I very much enjoyed the Prince's Trust activity that was undertaken in Basingstoke at the, uh, what's now, six weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any more? No. Okay. Item eight, Chairman's announcements. Uh, you will know, and if you don't know, I will tell you, <coughs> that the excellent news that our Chief Fire Officer, Neil, was uh, awarded the um, Queen's Fire Service Medal in, the, in Her Majesty's Birthday Honours List in June, which is outstanding for his performance um, overall in terms of what he'd been there for COVID, of the combination of the Isle of Wight and Hampshire, um, and throughout his, his tenure as chief, which is excellent news for Neil, it's excellent news for the service, and the authority, and for Hampshire. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> His medal bar gets longer and longer. <laughs> the Americans call it a salad bar. 
Uh, okay, moving on. The Prince's Trust final presentations at the Ride Fire Station. Um, on the 14th of April, myself and Neil attended the final presentation ever, the first ever one on the Isle of Wight, um, based on the Prince's Trust team programme. Uh, the, the ceremony was held to mark the achievement of the latest young people to complete the 12-week team programme. Present was the Lord Lieutenant of the Island, Susie Sheldon, JP, and the High Sheriff, K. Marriott, JP. They were both there, um, as so was Councillor Ian Stephen. Uh, it was a good day, Ian, wasn't it? Very good. It was um, excellent. Uh, and I'm proud that the positive impact that, that we provide for these young people in the community is, is actually recognised and welcomed. Um, while we're on the subject of the Prince's Trust, and indeed um, the um, uh, cadets, uh, you know, I, I have spoken to a lot of you, and the, um, the assumption is, or, or shall I say the requirement, is that you know, whenever there's a Prince's Trust um, put on, or a fire cadets, that actually one of us, or more from the authority, is present. Because you know, the fire cadets are our future. And it's A, good fun, it's B, it is, it is the, the pet baby of the Lord Lieutenant of Hampshire, and even for that reason we should support it. So, so if you are going to go to it, and thank you, do please make sure that you either tell Nikki or um, Fiona that you are going to go so that you can be treated appropriately when you get there. <laughs> okay. Um, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the Prince's Trust team programme. And the course has been completed now by over 1,500 young people, many of whom have gone on to training and employment. <coughs> uh, Neil, uh, Councillor Price and myself attended the Fire Commission presentation, which was chaired by um, Councillor Stephen two days ago, uh, which was good. It centred around the, um, uh, the white paper, which all of which you've had a copy, but... It, you know, it, it all goes to build up a picture and a direction in which we perhaps would like it to go. Um, Chief, any comments? The um, Her Majesty's Inspection of, of um, Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services consult consultation, um, they are consulting with the fire sector in, its, in the inspection programme and the framework for 23-24 at this moment. In particular, the inspectorate is seeking views from the sector on whether the right areas of fire and rescue service activities are covered under the current inspection regime and what other aspects of fire and rescue service activity the inspectorate can focus on. The service has responded based on experience of the three inspections, the initial round one for Hampshire and separate IOW fire and rescue service at the 2020 COVID inspection and the current round two inspection, which is drawing to its close at the end of this month. Uh, if you want any further questions, do please contact uh, Shantha Dickinson on that. Anything? Just to say, Chairman, um, and, and Shantha will give a further update at the next APAC, but um, the, as you mentioned, the uh, inspection is drawing to a close in the next week or so. Um, so very much us trying to glean as much as we can out of their findings at this stage, but uh, the report is always some way delayed into the autumn until we actually get the full reports, but we'll try to learn what we can straight out of that inspection. Great opportunity for us to learn and grow, um, and uh, our officers have all been completely engaged in that process over the last uh, well, numerous weeks, actually, with the US. So uh, it's, it's, been, it's been very useful so far. Okay, thanks. Uh, next up, the Home Office Emergency Evacuation Information Sharing Consultation. The Home Office is currently consulting on emergency evacuation information sharing. The aim is to establish a way forward in identifying and recording vulnerable persons in high-risk or high-rise residential premises. This follows the findings within the Grenfell Inquiry. The consultation is seeking views on proposals to support the fire safety of residents who would need support to evacuate in an emergency. Officers advise that their view is that legal duty must fall on the responsible person in some way to mitigate the dangers of tenants living in buildings with inherent design shortcomings. The service plays an active role in the National Fire Chiefs Council-led uh, work and will be responding to the consultation before the deadline date of the 10th of August. 
Chief, can you put that into English for us? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. So um, some members may remember the, the PEEPs, the Personal evac Emergency Evacuation Plans that we talked about in the back of the Grenfell Inquiry, <coughs> uh, one of the recommendations <coughs> made. And uh, government has um, tried to find a pragmatic way of delivering uh, those in practice, bearing in mind that what would need to happen in, in that regard would be to for building owners to somehow, and building ownership, as you all know, in these buildings is sometimes quite complex, um, identify who is the owner, who is the responsible person, uh, and we have ways of finding that out should it come to legal action, but it's all a bit late then. Um, <coughs> so the idea of, of trying to find a pragmatic solution to protecting the most vulnerable um, is one which government is consulting on, um, and certainly I know the LGA and the NFCC have a very similar view in the sense that uh, the legal responsibility needs to remain with the building, the, the responsible person of the building. It cannot shift to the fire rescue service. Otherwise, we end up with an impossible situation where, where operationally we cannot guarantee we can get everywhere at once uh, and we can't be where the most vulnerable you know, are. So they're therefore building owners who are taking a rent have a responsibility to make sure those people who reside in those buildings are safe. So that's the work we're doing currently with uh, NFCC and LGA to represent those views back to government. But I think there's some some water to go under the bridge yet before we find a, a sensible resolution. Okay, thanks. <coughs> and lastly, in this section, um, I just want to mention that Councillor Ian Stevens, uh, our Isle of Wight representative, is stepping down from his um, his position as Ian. What is it? Formerly the Fire Service Management, Management Committee, Committee and the Fire Commission uh, at the last meeting of its business. I won't repeat no, everything no, no, no. I've said, but I thank you for uh, indicating that I do have a microphone, Chairman. Um, yes, I've, um, we've had a very busy time over the last five years with building safety and uh, fire prevention, and you've touched on the elements and, and so has the Chief so far, so I think that I don't need to go into that, but I think that, um, yeah, five, five years of um, uh, Touring and throwing from the Isle of Wight to London and being on at one stage 10 different committees and working groups is enough to uh, say, right, uh, time for a fresh, we've got so far now and we're working on um, ways, uh, ways forward. Um, and I think it's time now to uh, move aside and allow someone else to uh, take up the reins and uh, uh, proceed with uh, the good work that the NFCC, the LGA, and indeed HMICFRS are doing. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I particularly enjoyed all the meetings of yours which you chaired, which I've been to, they've been good fun. And also thank you for your um, consistent um, praise and congratulations <laughs> and promotion of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Service and Authority. I must respond on that, uh, Chair, because I'm, str I'm a straight-talking person and I only say what is actually factual and correct. And I believe that, uh, you know, I've met with the, the, the vast majority of uh, fire authorities throughout England and some in the, in the other uh, nations. But what I would say is that... Uh, we can hold our heads up high in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight to say that we have got, if not the best, then one of the best uh, fire authorities. Now I say that because it's down to the committee and uh, down to members and uh, participation of all. But I think that um, throughout, from uh, members uh, within this room to the officers and the firefighters, we certainly... Uh, can hold our heads up high, as I've said, and uh, be uh, e extremely proud. We're always, as the Chief just said, we're always looking to uh, uh, make inroads and uh, uh, improvements, and we'll continue on that uh, line, because that's that's what's inbred in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Fire Authority. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very good. And the cheque's in the post. Um, no, thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, item nine, uh, we move to on page seven of your information pack, <coughs> which is the appointments report, and I would ask Paul Hodgson to introduce this. 
Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, good morning, members. Um, this is the usual appointments report that we bring to the authority's annual meeting each year. Um, and for the benefit of new members, I will just run through what we cover in the report. Um, it deals with the overall uh, membership and political proportionality of the authority um, following appointments made by the constituents' authorities last month. Um, it also deals with the proportional allocation of seats on the authorities to standing committees together with some other appointments and then finally deals with some uh, general dispensations just to avoid any conflicts over certain matters that the authority considers in the year. So following the appointments made by the constituent authorities last month, the political composition of the authority is set out at, at appendix one to the paper and seats on the authorities to standing committees need to be allocated according to the requirements of the local government and housing act 1989 and that means that so far as is reasonably practicable seats on each committee need to be allocated in proportion to the political groups on the authority and we now have three political groups on the authority, the Conservatives with six members, the Liberal Democrats and Independent group with three members, and the Labour group with two members. So in light of that, the proposed proportionality table and allocation of seats on the committees appears at Appendix 2, and um, that's for agreement. And then also in the recommendations, we'll be asking for confirmation of the names of the members from each group, will be appointed to those committees. Paragraph six of the report covers appointments that have been made to the pension board, and these have, uh, have already been made and continue, so no new appointments needed there, um, but one of the recommendations ju does just ask for confirmation that those appointments continue. Paragraph seven then deals with a number of other appointments, 7A, confirms that all members are appointed to the authority's policy advisory group, as previously. 7B deals with appointment to the principal office of pay group, which is the informal member working group that considers and makes recommendations back to the authority about gold book pay review. 7C covers a minority group spokesperson, and um, we now obviously have two opposition groups, so we will have two opposition uh, spokespeople. Um, the principal opposition group is the Liberal Democrat and Independent group, but we've also got the Labour group as well, and I think um, Councillor Bunday is, is the leader of that group, so we, we can confirm that and just uh, have that recorded in the minutes. Um, paragraph 7D covers appointments of independent persons to the authority, which is something we're required to have, um, and that's just for noting that the previous appointments continue. Paragraph 7E um, asks the authority to appoint a member as its shareholder representative in respect of 3S Fire Community Interest Company, and as previously, it's recommended that that should be the chairman of the stakeholder committee. 7F asks the authority to note the fact that 3S Fire currently has three directors, and that's just for noting there's no new appointments needed there. And 7G asks members to note uh, the updated member allowance scheme, which has been updated following the recent NJC pay award. And then finally, paragraph 8 asks the authority to just agree to two general dispensations in respect, firstly, of precept setting, and then secondly, members allowance scheme. These have been agreed in previous years and just give certainty for members that they can participate freely in discussions and votes on those matters without being conflicted or having any um, prejudicial interest. So that's all I think I need to say about the report. At, um, in the recommendations, um, just to confirm, recommendation 27 requires confirmation of the names of the members to be appointed to the committees. Recommendation 29 will need confirmation of the names of the members to be appointed to the Principal Officer Pay Working Group, and Recommendation 30 just needs confirmation of the uh, minority group spokespersons. Um, and there is actually a slight error in the wording at Recommendation 30. It should read um, that those appointments are until the next annual meeting rather than until the meeting in 2022, because obviously we're at that meeting, so <laughs> um, apologies for that.
Um, so I think that's all I need to say, Chairman, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Any questions? Right, okay. Well, if we go to the Chief, any? any so if we go to the recommendations then on page 12, <coughs> that the authority approves the current schedule of meeting of the authority and its committees for the coming year at Appendix 3, that the purpose of Part 1 of the Local Government and Housing Act 1989, uh, the allocation of seats to the Standards and Governments Committee and the Stakeholders Committee of the Authority be set out at Appendix 2 of the report, that the authority appoints members of the Standards and Governance Committee and the Stakeholder Committee to their respective chairman and vice chairman following the agreed allocation of seats in paragraph five. That with regard to the pension board, the authority consider the position as set out in paragraph 10 of the report and confirm the appointments as set out in paragraph 10 of the report. Um, if you wanna know then standards and governance committee uh, chaired by Councillor Meller and Vice Chairman is Councillor Harrison and members are Councillor Huggins, Councillor Hughes and Councillor Corkery with the substitute members Councillor Kerno Ford and Councillor Stephen. And the Stakeholder Committee is chaired by Councillor Price and Vice Chair is Councillor Mann members being Councillor Bundy, Councillor Kerno Ford, Councillor Huggins, and substitute members, Councillor Stevens and Councillor Hughes. And the pension board, Councillor Price remains as the employer representative. Uh, where do we get to? That, uh, okay, 28, that APAG includes all appointed um, authority members as set out in paragraph 7a of the report until next year's AGM. That the authority appoints three members and identify one of these as chairman to an informal working group for the review of principal officer pay as detailed in paragraph 7b of the report until the AGM next year. And those three will be Councillor Meller as chairman, Councillor Price and Councillor Hughes that the minority spokesman for the Liberal Democrat Party group until the inaugural meeting of the Combined Fire Authority uh, next year is confirmed, which will be you. Excellent. Councillor Price. That the authority note the current appointment of the independent person on the authority as referred to in paragraph 7D. Is that the... Yeah, As uh, Paul mentioned in his um, resume of the report, there needs to be a formally recognised the Labour Group uh, leader. Which is Councillor Bundy, yeah? Yeah. Oh, you mentioned me, and I, yeah, I was just thinking you need to mention that one as well. <laughs> um, and we recognise Councillor yeah. Bundy <laughs> as, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, 32, that the chairman of the stakeholder committee be appointed as the shareholder representative of 3S Fire, CIC, pursuant of Article 42 of the Articles of Association of 3S Fire, CSC, as set out in paragraph 7E of the report until the AGM next year. That the authority grants dispensation under section 32 2A and D of the Localism Act 2011, expiring on the 30th of June 23, in respect of the provision of sections 31, 4A and B of the Localism Act, and to all members to enable them to participate and vote in any business of the authority relating to the setting of council tax or precepts when they would otherwise be prevented from doing so in consequence of a beneficial interest in land within the administrative area of the authority, and B, to all members in receipt of an allowance under the authority's members' allowance scheme or members' allowances scheme, enabling them to participate and vote in any business of the authority where they may otherwise be prevented from doing so in consequence of being in receipt of a member's allowance. And 34, that members note the updated members' allowance scheme as set out in Appendix 4. Agreed? 
and, all. And congratulations for getting through that recommendation, <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Paul, happy? Excellent, Joe. Well done. Good. Um, phew. Right, <laughs> item 10, which is on page 23 of your info pack, which deals with the fire reform white paper. Chief? Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Members, just to introduce the paper, um, as the paper suggests, we will be uh, debating this further at uh, an authority policy advisory group to help form uh, your final response to government for the consultation. But essentially, the government wants to ensure that our fire and rescue services are given the tools and support to tackle the ever-changing challenges that our communities face, which is the sort of centre of this consultation. Um, it uh, centres around three things, the actual white paper. It talks about people, where proposals seek to clarify the role of the firefighter and to build culture that welcomes every member of our community. Also, the next strand is around professionalism, where, we, where government looks to provide greater development and leadership opportunities to all fire service staff, no matter how experienced they are. And lastly, it's around governance, where government wants to explore the potential in providing operational independence to chief fire officers, amongst some other things. So there are the three kind of main themes. In the paper itself, there's a bit more detail around some of the items of that white paper, which you may well by now have familiarised yourself with. Uh, the purpose of today's paper is not necessarily debated here, but of course that's your, your choice, Chairman. Uh, it's really to introduce the white paper to you formally uh, via the Fire Authority. The consultation closes on the 26th of July, which allows us officers to support you as members, have the debates you need to have for us to inform the response to the consultation, not necessarily shape the future as you wish to see it, but in terms of shaping the response to the consultation on behalf of the Fire Authority. My sense is that I may well do one with your permission separately from the Fire Service, but I need to, set, I need to base that on the Fire Authority's position and what you're, what you're considering. So we will make sure we create enough space in the APAG meeting, and the Deputy Chief Shanford will do that, uh, and perhaps deal with things on a white paper that are less maybe it may cause less contention um, or maybe a fairly direct uh, answer, create the right debating space for the other issues which you may want more time to consider. So the paper really is there for your information to formally present the white paper to you for to, to allow us to start the consultation process with you uh, and then we will uh, draft the response. Uh, my intention would be to, albeit the, uh, the recommendation is to delegate authority to myself to uh, finalise the actual uh, response in consultation with the uh, chairman. My intention would be to circulate to all members to make sure you're comfortable, but clearly, even with a reduced fire authority of 11 people, which is uh, still the most efficient and smallest in the country, uh, is still a challenge to get 11 people to agree to every single word in the report in a, in a response letter. But nonetheless, we'll have the APAG, and my intention is to circulate it for your views so you can feed those back to the chairman or myself before we finalise the report back to uh, government on your behalf. Happy to take questions at that point, chairman. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Neil. Um, my one question is, um, clearly they're looking for responses from potentially the Fire and Rescue Service, of which you are the Chief Fire Officer, and potentially the Fire Authority. Is it the intention to provide two separate responses or a single uh, comprehensive response? So um, my intention at this stage, uh, I'll take steer, uh, would be two separate responses, but clearly not to repeat the Fire Authority's position um, so there'll be positions that I would take and my, my team would take on uh, governance. It's not our, not our space to take your view. We can describe what we think is good governance, um, but we would have no view on what that looked like, what model that would be. That's not our, our role. So there are bits which we could comment on which you can't and vice versa. So we'll look to uh, separate those things out where necessary, but won't needlessly repeat what the fire authority has already reached. No, there definitely will be an authority view because we're the ones under threat. Um, so, yeah, without a doubt. Chairman, I, I just wondered for the benefit of new members if they are aware of the importance of APAG. Um, I've certainly found it a really important forum for discussing things. Whilst it's informal, we deal with some pretty um, meaty items there, and I, and I found it a really valuable um, place in which we can discuss things. Um, I just wonder whether there is a danger that the new members, was it, was it um, covered during the induction? Uh, yeah, let me ask the new members. Are you, are you aware of the importance of APAG? Um, we are, yes, that was part of the, the um, induction process. Yeah, but a good point. Well done. 
Um, okay, so we will leave it to, I mean, the, like all white papers, some of it was good, some of it wasn't. Um, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is, which you notice immediately, is that all the options and everything, you know, the one thing it doesn't cover is what does a combined authority do, which is us. Um, so you, you feel rather so slightly left out of the thought process, but we will discuss this at APAG where you can vent your spleen as much as you want. Carl. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, while I appreciate the desire to discuss this at APAG, which I, I will kind of willingly engage in that process, um, I'm also aware that APAG is a meeting that takes place behind closed doors and uh, without kind of public scrutiny or involvement. So therefore, for the public record, I would just like to make um, a brief comment on a particular aspect of the white paper that has concerned um, myself and colleagues that I've discussed the matter with. Um, and that is with regards to the potential changes to the NJC um, national negotiation process. Um, and the concerns which have been brought to me that I do share is that these potential changes risk undermining collective bargaining and employment rights of firefighters and other fire service workers. Um, and I would like to, as I say, put on record that if that does take place, I think that's no way to reward firefighters and fire service workers who contribute so much to keeping us all safe and well, and no less so than during the um, course of the pandemic. Um, so I do look forward to discussing that issue in particular in more detail during APAG, but I thought it was important to, to raise that publicly so that there is an awareness that this is something that we will be discussing further. Okay, thank you. Noted. Thank you. Uh, okay, so have you any more, Chief? The recommendation is... On, on the recommendation, um, I'd like to add the following words uh, at the end. Following discussions with APAG, because that's what is outlined in, in paragraph 11, pages 24 and 25, and I think it's important that it's contained within the recommendation so it can be seen that it's going there and it's not just yourself and with respect to you and the Chief, just you making the decisions. Uh, okay, yep. Yeah. Can we, can we fill that in to the recommendations, which I can't find at the moment? Okay, so moving to the recommendations then, that the white paper is noted by the authority, full authority, and the authority is delegated to the chief fire officer in consultation with the chairman to finalize and submit a response to the consultation on behalf of the full authority. And then, Roger, your words again, just so we can... Following go. discussions with APEG. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Right. Item 11. Uh, end of year performance and safety plan report, which is starts on page 73 of your pack. And I would invite Shantha Dickinson. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. So I'm delighted to introduce our annual performance report to you, which looks back over the longer term, specifically um, around the performance of the service with respect to the safety plan, which is the fire authority's specific ask of the service over a five year period, and also the core measures, both corporate and operational, which focus on how the service is, is building safer communities and places within Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. As a reminder from the induction session and other um, member awareness sessions, of course, performance oversight is consistent and critical to a critical aspect of running the service. And throughout the FAR Authority reporting year, whilst I present this annual report and also a, six, a report at the six monthly point, there's lots of other performance reporting um, that you will be exposed to and scrutinizing the service on, of course, which we welcome. I'd ask you to look behind the headline figures and be keen to um, answer questions on them. And when we look back at the last year, I'd ask you to keep in mind that we have um, just come out of a two year period of disruption, a pandemic, and that our performance is under constant review 
by the service. In terms of where measures have declined, we will set out and set out within the report clear rationale as to why. And in ca many cases, this has been part of a deliberate wider strategic approach. However, we still perform as a service extremely well in comparison to the national benchmark and to um, other services within Family Group 4, which is other fire and rescue services which are most similar to us. So in terms of the uh, socio-demographics, in terms of geography, and I'll touch on that in a moment. So what I will do is I'll go through the, um, the cover report and take out some key extracts for you, and then myself and colleagues will be happy to answer any specific questions you've got on both appendices A and, uh, a and B. So before I take out some key extracts within the report, um, I want to draw your attention to incidents overall. And you'll note overall they have reduced. When we compare ourselves within our family group, I want to give you a couple of examples of where we're performing extremely well. So in the number of deliberate fires per 10,000 of the population, we are only one of five services to have seen a reduction within the last year. Also, when we talk about fires that are contained to the room of origin, so that means we're able to extinguish them and contain them to where they start is, we are ranked third. So again, an exceptionally strong performance about how effective we are at fighting fires. And finally, the other statistic I would like to raise with respect to how we compare to others is we have, within the family group, the lowest number of calls per 10,000 of the population, which points to evidence of effective prevention activity. So moving on to the highlights that is, are mentioned within the cover report. Firstly, you'll notice the... Um, increase over the year of staff sickness, but we have gone back to, uh, to pre-pandemic levels. We've been undertaking over the year, and as we look forward into this, this year that we're in, significant work to understand the effects of the pandemic on people's well-being. And also, we have been uh, conducting different return to work fitness tests for all of our operational firefighters and fire officers as well, so that when people are back, they're back and they're safe. Of particular note is uh, mental health as an increasing factor within sickness, and in particular within our Green Book staff, so those are primarily our non-operational staff members. And again, I'd like to emphasise that uh, we are doing lots to understand this further and to support our staff. Looking now to availability, which is headlined within paragraph 5. So you'll note that our overall availability levels have reduced in comparison to the last year. I'll leave it to the Director of Ops perhaps um, afterwards to take questions on whole time availability, but I will um, point to that being part of a deliberate plan in terms of supporting partners more widely, and there's plenty of examples within that how that um, had an impact on communities and saving lives across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Also, you'll note our on-call availability has decreased down 18%, but again, I'd um, offer looking behind the headline figures. So whilst it is true during the, year, the first year of the pandemic, we enjoyed an unprecedented high levels of on-call availability, and we can attribute that to the furlough levels and people being effectively at home and therefore available to provide cover. When we look at on-call availability, what um, we look behind the figure and we would, um, would demonstrate that during the times when people are most at risk, so at night and in the evenings, that is when our availability is a lot higher. So to kind of look at it as, as one figure is somewhat... Um, dilutes that, that effect in terms of how our on-call colleagues are available. And also, as we go um, through this next year, we are the service is undertaking a project to look at improving on-call ways of working. So that's um, furthering the on-call support officers, the station managers that we have supporting on-call stations, and also working to align as part of the 
um, legacy work from the combined fire authority aligning the terms and conditions for on-call firefighters both on the mainland and on the island, but then also looking at a more sustainable model that is more attractive so that we can um, attract new people to, to on-call and that um, figure of improving that overall figure as well. And that's some detail behind the, um, the on-call and hold time availability as well. And then again, with respect to um, average critical response time, you will see an increase and it's there in terms of our average um, critical response time. However, when we compare ourselves across the country to like services, both in terms of um, the family group, in terms of rural and split, again, we are uh, shown to be, to be favourable. And I'll draw your attention back to that statistic I gave you about being in the top three, about fires being in the room of origin. So we're getting there quickly, and when we're getting there, we're being effective in um, bringing people to safety and an effective response to. Of course, um, it goes, it, it's, it's deeply disappointing that there have been an increase in fire fatalities, but we're doing an increased work with our prevention, our safe and well activities, uh, visits have um, increased by 29%. Um, when there are cases, very sadly, where people have died in fires, we're working very closely with our colleagues in other um, local authorities and partner organisations to understand the causation and that's always going to be on ongoing work as well. <clears throat> I'd also like to draw your attention whilst it's not highlighted within the cover report to um, within the performance report the section both on health and safety and value for money. You'll note within health and safety we talk about leading and lagging indicators, so leading indicators being proactive measures of health and safety, lagging being after the event, and the leading slightly outweighing the lagging, and also a reduction on RIDOR of reportable uh, specific injuries. What I'd like to highlight within that is how we have an ever-growing positive safety culture that all of our staff not just our health and safety specialists take um, extreme responsibility for. And finally, within the value for money section um, in the app Appendix A, that um, demonstrates again the favourable position in terms of Hampshire as a combined fire authority. And then when we look back in terms of the island as a part of County Council um, in respect to other English fire and rescue services. So that's the um, overall performance of the service. I'll now, um, sorry, before I move on to the safety plan, I've mentioned briefly about our reduction in volume of, of incidents and incident types. I want to draw your attention as well to the fact that we are working hard on understanding the impacts of cost and living. We had some data um, released by the government this week which points to overall in Hampshire, 7.4% uh, 7 of families, or rather households, being in fuel poverty. So what we're working to on is targeting our prevention work ever further, but also an assumption that if you carry that forward and that picture, 7.4% is the average, but looks different across the different um, districts and uh, structures within Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, that could possibly translate into more unsafe practice and therefore fires. So really, really important that our uh, prevention work is A, very active, but also agile and able to respond to this cha changing situation. So I'll now um, take out some key extracts from Appendix B, which is the safety plan, which is the fire authorities ask of the service. Looking back at the second year of the safety plan, we originally committed to 34 improvements, which is a reduction in the first of the first year of year one. And that's really as a result of um, our COVID um, related activities and also recognizing that the service needed to go through a period of stabilization. The appendix with the slide pack gives lots of detail, which I, I won't repeat, but would be very happy to answer any questions on in terms of what has, what has been done. 
and also gives um, uh, more than a flavour of the areas that the service is focusing on in terms of improvement within year three. And of course, now in June, we're in the first quarter of year three, so work is very active and underway uh, to deliver that. Um, again, in terms of the golden thread, the safety plan being what informs the activities of every single team member within our service, we as an, uh, as an executive group, we, um, we as the senior officers, look and scrutinise the progress of those activities routinely and also those activities and those um, challenges that you as the fire authority have set us um, are embedded within each of our own directorate plans and in turn within team plans and then in turn with individuals goals um, for the forthcoming years. There's very much that golden thread from the safety plan down to what the individual does. So to conclude, um, I would absolutely highlight how the last two years, although, <coughs> excuse me, we're only looking back over one year, has had an impact on our people, on our communities, on our partnership working. It will be interesting as we go forward now into this next year that we're in to see how um, performance changes as life normalises. We don't lightly use the word proud, but we are incredibly proud of what the service has achieved over the last year. We've had significant challenges um, come our way in terms of our staff sickness and the fact that we've been able to uh, continue to deliver our critical services to the public as a fire and rescue service, but also then support our partners who at specific points have been in crisis through activities such as ambulance driving, vaccination, etc. We're very, very proud of everyone who belongs to the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service family who have all contributed to that strong performance. And I think I will leave it there and be delighted to serve myself or other colleagues to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Shantha, thank you. Um, proud is good. Okay? Not to be embarrassed about. Question, Dave. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there's a lot of really positive things in, the, in this report. Um, I, I was particularly impressed with the increase in the number of safe and well visits that have been carried out. And, and it seems to me that that's creating a sort of really positive loop because the more work that's done on prevention, that obviously has an effect on reducing the number of call-outs, which is good for, in terms of value for money. So, so that, that's a really positive thing. But my question is, what do we do in the case of people who refuse entry? Because arguably, the people that refuse entry um, are the most at risk. It could be mental health problems, it could be criminality, it could be that they're growing cannabis um, in the home. Um, I, I just wonder if you could uh, explain what we do in the case of refusals. Thank you for the question. So um, we don't have any um, powers of entry, so we, we won't force our way into someone's house. Um, it's very much done on an educational basis. So the safe and well visit has two two parts: one on, uh, around education, one around the uh, fitting of smoke detectors. Um, but the education is very much the the primary point um, of focus. Um, one of the aspects that works really well for us is uh, community safety officers who are dedicated. Um, uh, individuals, professionals um, who know about the safety of people who are very convincing uh, and try to educate the people uh, not to refuse. But we also work quite closely with local authorities um, and third sector agencies. So looking to use other ways to, to access that, that building um, through every means that we can. But certainly what we won't be able to do and, and what we wouldn't uh, choose to do is, is try and force ourselves in um, to the premises. Okay. I'm not completely satisfied by that answer. Um, are we logging um, refusals and following up every single one, or are we making some sort of judgment about these based on our experience of you know, how the refusal comes across? Yeah, so all, all of our records um, are included, so from the date of 
referral right the way through to all of the contact that we make um, with that uh, occupier or the, um, the, the people that are responsible for the occupier, um, all the way through to successful delivery or the refusal of a, um, of a safe and well visit. So we can track everything through our database of all of the interactions and we do that on a regular basis and review that um, to try and you know access the, the right people. Quality um, of referral is, is much more um, important to me uh, as the director of ops than the number of visits. So uh, absolutely, I, I would love for us to do the number of visits to all of the, the places that are the most vulnerable. But if that was half, but we knew that they were the absolute uh, people that we needed to target, I, I would be satisfied with that. It, it's about quality and, and we drive that through the community safety team all, all the time. Thank you very much. Roger. Thanks, Chairman. I've got a num number of questions. The first one is on, on the item five, is the availability of on-call, um, which has gone down the 18%. I'm interested to know whether it is in a particular part of the county uh, mm. because we have a difference in getting staff for the, that job or whether it is generally right the way across and was it really affected totally by COVID or any other circumstances? It's the first one. Yeah, I'll take that one as well. Um, so not uh, geography uh, doesn't necessarily play its p play an important role, although there are cer certain locations which are difficult to uh, recruit to. So they're particularly, you know, individual villages or, or rural areas, but across the board, it's not one particular locality across the county um, or the island. Um, time of day um, plays an important role uh, when we look at the, the figures. So the overall figure that you're given um, is, is the figure that doesn't take into account the differences between daytime and nighttime. So during the daytime, we can reduce our availability quite significantly, um, and we um, will we'll generally see that th through the working hours as people have generally traveled further for work. Um, nighttimes and at weekends, we generally see uh, an uplift. So every day from probably around about seven o'clock in the evening, um, going right the way through to around about eight o'clock in in the morning, we see uh, a gradual rise up to 80, 90% availability on most stations. And then that comes back down again during the day um, when we have that challenge uh, around where to put our resources. So control on a, on a dynamic basis um, will, um, uh, will move our resources to fit the risk profile. Um, so what they're experiencing in terms of calls and also in terms of where our holes are around the county so that we can maintain our performance in terms of um, in terms of response uh, and making sure we respond well. The next one is to do with timings, response times, which has always been my bugbear, as you know, because over the years we've been going down in, in the attendance time. Now, I understand the comment that we are placed in a good position compared with some of nationally. But I don't think we should compare, I guess, with nationally. My belief is we should be aiming to get our times down to the lowest possible times that is feasible to get to any incident. And therefore, I would be interested to know if you take um, what the average rural is and the average urban is, um, do we differ very much on those or not? And particularly, I mean, you've made uh, Chanta the, the comment about uh, comparing us with like authorities. Um, we're very, very good, but it still seems to me we should get our times down because uh, that's what it's all about, getting to an emergency whenever it's needed. So on the specific question, I think um, I can come back to you, you on that in terms of the rural plus plus urban. Oh, Stu says he's got that, so we'll come back to him in a minute. But um, I think there is no way of sugarcoating it when you look at the times that have declined. But again, I would ask you to um, point, you know, I would point you to what we've done when we're there and the fact that whilst um, getting from point A to point 
B will never change over time other than roads improve in terms of the efficiency of teams, firefighting tactics, the safety of buildings, etc. It's what we do at the other end and how effective we are that makes the real difference. But, but I absolutely take your point on board that they have declined and we should be doing everything we can do to improve them. Just comment on that because we uh, uh, made a decision of a few years ago about changing the number of appliances or type of appliances, etc. And one of the things was said that that would, would bring our times down, but it doesn't seem to have done that. It seems to have gone the other way. So I think there's there's a few factors uh, involved in that. So that that specific statement was a was an assumption uh, from a smaller vehicle being able to be faster uh, on the roads, which uh, wasn't actually. Um, when we had the evidence, that wasn't actually the case. Um, if I look between um, overall spread, there is a there is a big spread. Um, so we have a very rural area. So if I take Portsmouth as an example, um, our average response time to critical incidents in Portsmouth is um, 5 15, um, 5 minutes 15 seconds, which is very low. Um, and if you look at other city areas around the country, that would be competing, you know, very highly. Um, with the response time that we get there. Uh, on the other hand, some of our more rural areas, um, there's a lot more of a travel distance. And actually, when we look at the, uh, the analysis, the difference between if we bunch up all of the city areas and the rural areas, there's a difference of around about three minutes, um, which taken into account we have a four minute difference in turnout times is not actually you know, too bad in terms of our rural performance. Um, the difference that we have seen is that we've actually had an improvement um, with our response to fires, so primary fires, so house fires in particular. Um, we've seen an improvement in that um, statistic. But what we have seen is a, a decline hugely um, in our ability to get to road traffic collisions um, quick enough. So those areas where they are much more remote, the more serious um, RTCs, tend to be more remote and therefore more of a travel time. And that's an area that my team are looking at, um, is how that we really get into the figures and start to look at the different types of incident and what we can do about those, those incidents. So uh, the, the overall kind of average doesn't always tell uh, the, the picture of, a, of a necessarily a worsening um, situation. There are some areas which are, are areas that we can you know, quite rightly be proud of, uh, and uh, but uh, at the same time, quite rightly point us in a direction to analyse and work a bit harder on. Thank you. That, I mean, average, I agree with you, average is it's a headline. It, it, it doesn't give you the, the full facts. That's why one needs to try and ask behind, get behind them. Um, the next one is that, uh, coming on to what my colleague was sort of talking about, was the prevention. I was quite surprised that a quarter um, has refused entry. What I would be interested in, slightly different tack to David, um, is that if it's a particular type of property, um, which or the occupier of a particular type of property that's refusing, or was it to do with um, ethnicity, uh, which might be causing problems if you go to a house which is of a certain different religion, and they won't let you in. And can, because the skin may be of a different colour as well, they won't let you in. Are we getting down to that detail to know why? Yeah, so um, so again, going back to the um, the refusal. So the refusal is is a kind of, um, it's the, the way that we, re it's the, the language we use with our, our recording. Um, so there are um, quite a few, um, examples where we're unsuccessful in getting across the, the threshold of a premises where people aren't aware that we've actually got their, their information um, because they weren't f they, they've set they've signed if you like to, to suggest that we can be they can be referred to us but they weren't familiar with exactly what we were offering so um, so what we've done we've got uh, a team that look at our referral process so how we get the individuals, uh, details in the first place and where that comes from. So there's a multitude of, of different agencies that refer people to us. We've educated them to say these are the factors um, that we think put people at, at risk within their own homes. And what we're trying to do is close that loop uh, and gain all the statistical evidence to, to say 
okay, these ones were unsuccessful. So, uh, you know, it may be our partners in ambulance are providing us with a number of addresses which we can't then successfully deliver. Um, we'll go back to ambulance and we'll speak to them around how we make that referral much more, uh, much better, much more uh, we can educate the individual before we go there so that it's not, um, so that it's not, uh, you know, unsuccessful in, in terms of our, our time that we're saying there. Um, if I know, I can just take almost the kind of the diverse, equality, diversity and inclusion aspect too as well. So obviously Stu's spoken there about the, um, improving the quality of the referral process and sort of understanding that. But again, <clears throat> as a service, you know, I suppose there's a couple of points. Mm -hmm. Prevention, safe and well, it forms one aspect of prevention. So we'll be doing lots engaging other um, ages and demographics within the community. And of course, we've got a great opportunity with the 2021 census results um, coming through imminently in terms of understanding how our communities have changed. But then also with, with that as well, um, equality, diverse, diversity and inclusion is, is very, very important in terms of making sure we're communicating with our communities in the right ways so that we're understanding any barriers they might perceive from us so that we're able to improve that um, picture more. And then we've had this um, greater understanding of, if you like, the picture of vulnerability within our communities. So it all adds up, hopefully, to the, that, the refusal number looking very different as we go forward. The next one is on page 75, uh, paragraph 11. Um, uh, fire Standards Board setting 119 requirements. I'd be interested to know what the one is which is not applicable to Hampshire. Uh, it, it, it just seems strange that having set standards which are applicable for the fire service, uh, why one isn't applicable to Hampshire? <laughs> and also what the two that we haven't actually met yet. Yes, that's some real detail, Councillor Price, but um, we will come back to you on that. We, we can't, we're just conferring, can't think what that one is, but what it will be something, the reason it wouldn't be applicable, it's just it's simply not relevant. So an example I would give of another fire and rescue service would be for an example to have some kind of marine um, or ships alongside firefighting cap capability, which clearly wouldn't apply to Oxford. So it will be something that is just not, not relevant. We will come back to you on that. What, um, it, so thank you for the question, and what I um, would also like to emphasise with respect to the fire standards work is that the um, progress we've made in terms of compliance and also our approach to giving ourselves as a service and then obviously the fire authority assurance of our compliance, um, HMI have been particularly interested in our approach and have actually highlighted um, us within a, with a couple of other services to kind of pilot and, and share our best practice as well. But we'll come back to you on the detail if that's okay. Um, under 21, page 77, I'd like to put on record our congratulations to the staff because it's their work that's actually achieved all of these things here. And have, well, as far as I'm concerned, the, the service has been exemplary all through the COVID situation in all areas from the amount of things that, well, I mean, who would expect it, firefighters to go into a uh, hospital in working in a hospital, et cetera, and um, they're just exemplary. So I think we should place as authority our appreciation and thanks on record. So on that one, 23, um, fire alarms. With the new building regulations which have come out, or are in the basis of coming out, and possible lots of new buildings, and people having to put in fire alarms into buildings which they never had to before, and probably are not very concerned that the developer will put them in and then move away and forget about them. And is that good to have, or has any thought been put about whether this could have an effect upon the number of call-outs which we are going to get to such things, sort of false alarms, and cause us a, a major problem. Um, any sort of thoughts on it? So all major developments, um, we have a team uh, that um, consult on building regulations. So they will be responsible for uh, giving a view, uh, a view and opinion of, of whether 
the proposed fire protection measures uh, are appropriate. So um, that will go on uh, and continue. And, and if anything, with the building safety um, bill and uh, the new regulations as that moves forward, that will become tighter, I, I would hope. Uh, uh, and I think all people, uh, you know, everyone would hope that. Um, with regards to AFAs, um, it is an area which, from my perspective, um, concerns me uh, a bit because you know they're they're, um, they're calls that we needlessly need to go to um, so there is a bit of work we have been tracking that I've had a report to my board um, some four or five months ago and it's just a question of uh, timing to implement um, some work around uh, how we assess and move forward on our um, response to AFAs uh, to make sure that not that we're abandoning the public in any way, but we're ap appropriately responding to um, those types of calls because it is an emerging um, and growing issue for us across the county. And my last point is under the together we make life safer is that under people is got hybrid working and I can understand a lot of people working from home. What I'm concerned about is what steps do we take to make sure that our staff have got a right sort of place to work in this home and they have the right computer equipment there and also the right chair because it's no good using a, using a dining room chair if you're going to be working from home all the, a lot of the time. Um, so what steps are we taking to make sure our staff are safe in that respect and also from a mental health point of view? Thank you, Councillor Price, for that question. So the success of the hybrid working procedure um, is very much rooted in the management oversight um, that we have in terms of the systems in place to make sure that, for example, all managers are ensuring that their staff are doing a full DSE assessment to make sure that all of the, um, the, the working facilities is safe. But that really comes back to, if you like, where we start with hybrid working. So it works for some people. It doesn't work for others in terms of their own preferences or domestic setup. We have an estate of 60-plus um, stations, locations, where it's not just about necessarily the office or the work dynamic. They can work in other places. Um, so, for example, we're even encouraging, which brings us back to the availability point, but um, some of our grey book staff to work in on-call stations, for example, which have lower availability during the day so to, to drive that up. But, um, but coming back to, if you like, the safeguards in place, it, has, it can only work if the manager and the team member are constantly having a discussion about how they're going to work when they're not in our own estate, and it's, it's a domestic uh, location. But also then, are people happy in terms of what they're doing? Are they being effective? So it's very much, it's, it's a challenge because it's a cultural move away from perhaps what one might call presenteeism to looking at managing through the outcomes and what they're doing. But it, it only works and it really ties us back to our, our values and our behaviours in terms of um, looking after each other and just ongoing discussion. So we've got the hard systems in place to make sure that, you know, for example, when I'm at home, my screen, etc., is, is appropriate, but then also it's that ongoing conversation with the manager and the employee. But a lot of the, lot of the responsibility sits with the employee of um, telling their manager exactly what equipment they've got at home to cope. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of chairs. I mean, I know the county, uh, I was told by a member of staff, the county delivered their home their chair from the office so they could work at home properly in a d with a decent chair. Uh, it's those sorts of details which I get concerned about uh, when people are working from home. If I can take that, um, Councillor Price, so yeah, that, that's exactly what we've done. So based on the DSC assessment, individuals can be provided with chairs, same as you would get in the office, and screens are provided, and even desks are provided, but obviously not of that not everyone has the physical space to accommodate all of those things, but should it work for them, those items are provided routinely. So we've, we've done that on a regular basis for staff. That's really what I was waiting to hear for. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for my question. Oh, you enjoyed that one. Um, Carl. <clears throat> thank, you. thank you, Chair, and thank you, Shampa, for bringing the report. Um, I was particularly interested in the section around sickness absence. Um, so one of the other roles that I play is chair of the Employment Committee at Portsmouth City Council, and probably like other local authorities, we get, I think, a 20 or 30 page sickness absent report to pretty much every employment committee meeting, which, which probably is a bit overkill, but it does help us to kind of get to grips with some of the details. And something that we have been interested to understand in a little bit more detail in previous years has been uh, mental health sickness absence, and in particularly how that can be kind of broken down and understood a little bit more. Um, so one of the things we've asked for, and it may be something that um, we as an authority are interested in also, is understanding how mental health breaks down, in particular um, work-related mental health versus kind of other mental health-related absence. Um, so whether there's any opportunities to understand a little bit more detail about that, also, just I know obviously there's only a kind of small paragraph here in terms of what's reported, and that's um, there's a lot of benefits to having it kind of summarised. But I think it would be useful from my perspective at least to also understand um, within the breakdowns how those have changed. Um, so, for example, we talk about stress related mental health being 13%. Is that up or down from the previous year, for example, just so we can understand if there are any trends that need um, further scrutiny? And Last but not least, I just wanted to ask um, to understand a little bit more about, again, the mental health-related um, sickness absence and what support is provided to staff, um, and also, in particular, what support is provided to staff who do experience work-related mental health issues um, in recognition that actually lots of fire and rescue service staff will be attending, for example, traumatic incidents that may then lead um, to particular mental health sickness issues. Thank you for um, those questions, I think, a few questions. Um, so absolutely, um, obviously you only have the headline figures um, there. What I want to assure you is that um, at our executive group on a routine basis, we do dig beneath that and specifically Molly, um, who obviously leads our people in organisational um, development um, directorate, um, sort of looks at that in, in great detail. So um, sort of taking um, the question more more generally in terms of what provision is um, is available um, we have for um, people who are exposed to um, difficult and traumatic circumstances well-established processes such as trim trauma risk incident um, management uh, we have mental health first aid is if you like strategically placed around um, all of our stations and teams with, within fire control in, including um, if you like it, this is kind of the first point of call to kind of tri triage people and to deal with those um, it sort of immediate um, situations. Obviously, all of our managers are trained and exposed to ha how to deal with that, and then they can utilise, if you like, more the management tools or our occupational health provision. We also would encourage our staff to reach into the firefighters charity as well, which exists to um, provide all of the firefighter community uh, beneficiaries with all sorts of... Um, treatments and services to, to help them. We have a employee, um, uh, employee assistance program, which is a kind of 24 seven, or I think it's more or less 24 hours, um, helpline that um, people can access, well, they can access on the phone, sort of, you know, chat bot, various, um, if they don't want to have a conversation through text, et cetera, <laughs> to get um, help on really a variety of things. And that almost brings me back to kind of where you started, which was, well, what is the picture? So it's more than um, pure absence. Is it what drives people to have to take the time away from work? And sometimes that can be workplace related, um, the broader concerns around financial well-being, pressures of care, you know, the homeschooling, if we think back to the sort of um, the recent past, and a whole host of uh, other situations that people find them that are highly individual to you. Um, so what we have done in the past is actually um, get statistics from our colleagues that have taken up the EAP provision to really understand that, that more, and we can do that at any point. But we also have, and this might be where, if, if the authority would find it useful, we'd be happy to come and talk in, in more detail, perhaps at APAG, on you know, helping you understand the big, the, the, the sort of the more detailed picture with respect to well-being. Um, but we've also undertaken over the course of the last three years, I think it is, well-being surveys to understand 
well, basically what, the, what individual circumstances are. And it hasn't been a pretty picture, as we've expected. There's been a, a lag through sort of COVID in terms of, you know, as probably we've all individually experienced some of the challenges that, that people are facing. So it is, it is complex. It's really difficult to kind of pinpoint that within a, a sort of fairly over <coughs> overarching report, which is why if, if it's useful, I'd be happy to kind of come back and talk at a later point. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Very similar lines, and you may well have answered it, but obviously, of course, our biggest asset is our people, yeah. so I think it, it's vitally important. Um, first of all, just to note some really good work and quite progressive um, around your value-based recruitment and seeing those values and behaviours translate into your management training, because we talked about hybrid working, um, and most of that is about autonomy and behaviours, so I, I commend you for that. That's, that's really progressive, so it's great to see that. I suppose similar to um, Cal is, is to ask for that detail because people are our biggest asset and I think to have that, that scrutiny and to, to understand would be vital. My point was, you know, um, the, the increase in musculoskeletal of 6% is, is another example of that, is understanding the detail. Um, is it um, job type? Um, is it um, equipment? Um, is it to do uh, with fatigue um, because of uh, hours worked, uh, mental health, both physical and psychology, psychological can um, impact on that. So I would like to unpack that in more detail and I, I, you know, I acknowledge that we're having headlines today. But in addition to that is understanding how that has a knock on effect to staff turnover. So are there pockets of staff turnover? Um, and also what does that look like in terms of long term um, multiple occurrences, so I would welcome that detail, so thank you. And Gary. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, you'll be very pleased to know, without any uh, coordination and choreography, Councillor Price asked most of my questions, so, uh, but, but I still have some, if I may. Um, I know 21,358 incidents in the reporting period. I'd be really interested to understand how those incidents are spread out across a 24-hour day? Are they more at night? Are they more during the day? RTCs more at night? I think it'd be really, because I think it, when we talk about availability, if the serious ones are in the evenings where you have greater availability, that, that would be quite reassuring to the authority that actually the plan you have in place is working. I think that'd be quite useful for us to understand. I do get very concerned about when I see the numbers of false alarms. You know, I, as I look at your high-level report here, that's the only increase. Everything else has decreased. It's the false alarms. And if we could find a way through your teams to reduce those false alarms, that would be very beneficial, save on resources, make sure that they're available for the, the genuine uh, instance rather than the ones that are not uh, 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 necessary. But the one I would like to ask, and it ties in very much to what the chairman said about the, um, I'll get the, the HOEEIS, uh, evacuation for, uh, for vulnerable people. You mentioned nine fatalities. Some of them had uh, ongoing issues in terms of vulnerability. Had any of those individuals been subject to safe and well visits and have refused them? Would be an interesting thing for us to know. But also the fact that, and this falls back to that question, and I ask it, pose it. You know, it could well be that the only way you can keep somebody who's vulnerable safe is to take them out of that environment. And that's a county issue for us in terms of keeping people safe and well in their homes. There's also an issue you have to address. I wonder, is any thought ever given to the fact you, one of the reasons is they should never have been in that home in the first place. Has, has that ever been a, a consideration? So if I, I'll take all, uh, I'll take all those. So um, if we look, the common picture of instant, numbers of instants peak in the evenings. So, um, sort of seven, uh, rush hour tends to be, you know, sort of from six onwards, um, we tend to see a, a peak and I get a daily report of all of the instant types um, which come come in and you're absolutely right. So the, the spread of, of the instance, automatic fire alarms or false alarms um, are the most prevalent type of instant. Um, following that is co-responding or medical response. Um, so as, as a, uh, a service, we we tend to do uh, a lot of that uh, type of work, and then it becomes very much lower, you know, in terms of the statistics. Those two are the outliers. Um, during the summer, more fires in the open. So what we'll see generally, so yesterday, the highest was uh, false alarms, followed by fires in the open, followed by uh, co-responding. So those three 
instant types and then very very few others. Um, so and and like I say, they do peak in the evenings. Um, in terms of vulnerability of uh, of people, uh, I mentioned in uh, one of my other responses about working with the local authority and our community safety officers. And part of that work is to work very closely with those uh, people and the housing provider to put them in the most appropriate housing. So in some circumstances, that does mean um, they shouldn't be in that type of housing. So they should, shouldn't be on an upper floor, for example, and we, we will try and advise um, authorities uh, uh, and housing authorities to, to bring them down to lower floors. Um, we'll also look at advising um, where people should be move to uh, other types of accommodation out of uh, essentially being at home. We've got um, quite a robust safeguarding uh, procedure and, uh, and all of our teams are, are trained in safeguarding, so spotting the signs uh, and being able to um, alert other authorities to, to be able to deal with those uh, properly. It just finally, in terms of the, uh, the fatalities, all of our fatalities go through uh, a post-incident uh, post um, protocol and what that means is that uh, as a multi-agency uh, and under the leadership of the um, normally the adult safeguarding boards um, through the local authorities, they get a review um, and that, that gets fed into the adult safeguarding uh, board to look for any uh, learning that needs to happen as a result of that, not just from a fire and rescue perspective, but across all of the agencies. So it's something that we've developed over the years um, to make fire much more important, if you like, in, in those environments and, and make the spread much greater rather than us just looking at our records and what we've uh, achieved. Um, I'm not aware of any of those uh, fatalities that have received uh, a safe and well visit beforehand, so I'm not aware that we've got that um, situation, but certainly I, I can tell you that that is the first question that I, I ask, what do we know about that? Um, that individual, what do we know about that premises, um, and then go from there, and uh, the team respond to that the following day. Uh, thank you for that. I, I, I do realise that we are asking questions here that take you right into the detail, and I know you're just trying to keep us at a high-level strategic uh, position, and so I, I, um, I, I, I make a little bit of an apology there, but we're really keen to help you. I think that's the important part. You know, if we can stop people living in unsafe environments caused by their own personal choices, because quite often they say, no, this is my family home, I've lived here forever, and I'm going to die here, well, you know, bang, you know, we, that's sorted. But there's a really key issue, that we want to keep you safe. We have a duty as, um, um, to keep our people safe, and essentially the information you have and sharing with the, uh, other authorities and other bodies to bring together a, a package of, inf of knowledge that says, actually, do you know what? Everything tells us that you are not safe. We must have the ability to speak out where appropriate in order to ensure that those fatalities are minimised as much as possible. So thank you. Thank you. Chief. Just wanted to say one thing about um, the automatic fire alarms. Um, we call it false alarms on the, on the data there. Um, I, I'm going to quote a, a colleague who's not here today, but um, and the saying goes something like this. We, we never proceed or go to a false alarm we only come back from one um but uh, that's not always true actually but nonetheless it's a, it's a, it's a useful um uh, metaphor for us to think about because um actually it's almost a bit like the leading and lagging indicators that Chantal was talking about earlier with the um health and safety it is good to have people noticing things which are unsafe and therefore it's good to have lots of smoke alarms lots of fire alarms because that keeps people safe but the the side effect of that is you get false alarms at first until people get used to understanding how to live in their, their, their properties safe, more safely. So what you get sometimes in this, in this regard is it's sometimes seen by some uh, as, as a negative thing, with lots of false alarms, but actually it could be seen as a, a, a sort of an early indicator of a very positive step towards more alarms being fitted, more awareness, uh, because people generally believe they've got a problem and they call us. They don't, uh, and fire alarms are there to forget to evacuate buildings to make people leave and maybe be safer. They're not necessarily there to call us. But what people tend to do is then call us because their fire alarm's going off. So there's a, we be careful about how we manage that relationship. But it is an interesting concept about uh, false alarms across the country, actually. And then you see the rise and fall of false alarms, but often associated with a, per a push or a drive on fitting 
more alarms, more smoke detectors in people's homes, and it leads to, of course, uh, false alarms eventually because people put them in the wrong places or they're not assisted by us, which we, we can help them make sure we reduce those once we know. So just a comment on, on the question, but I think it's a perfectly good question uh, and one that we'll continue to push and drive about our understanding about what's causing uh, the uh, alarms to sound if they're not real fires. Thanks. Uh, Derek, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, uh, Shantam, I congratulate you on what I think is an excellent uh, summary report. And uh, as a follow-up to it, I, I believe that some of this performance should be highlighted to members of the public. We did have uh, questions asked, of course, more relevant to this year, with the increases in precept that the police and the fire service were, uh, were awarded. And of course, that makes us more accountable for giving value for money to our uh, to the members of the public. Um, moving on from that, I'd just like to follow up a little bit on Councillor Hughes' remarks. Um, the nine fire fatalities, for one thing, is a concern, especially today, as we're still uh, effectively mourning Grenfell. Um, it is a 28% increase over the previous year, if, once, if one wants to go down the uh, analysis paralysis route. Um, can I just ask, were any of, was ever blame, you go on about PIP uh, follow-up, uh, Stuart, but was there any blame attached to the, um, the fire service for any of these deaths? Any contributory factor? Or were they old age, um, couldn't be moved, already deceased on arrival, or, or what? It's not broken down at all. Can I just ask, was there ever blame attached? That's the first question. Um, happy to say no. Okay. Um, of course, learning um, from each of those. Yeah. And so, in many cases, we're unable to get to the premises um, quick enough. So the, the the that we weren't alerted early enough. Um, and so that is uh, quite often uh, the case with a fatality is that it's in the, the nighttime hours, uh, and unfortunately. Um, the, the building or the fire has, has taken hold for some time before we're alerted. Um, of course, like I say, learning from each one of those as to uh, other agencies or other people that were aware of those people and we could have intervened. Uh, and likewise with the, uh, the answer to Councillor Hughes um, where we could have advised potentially um, better accommodation. Um, on two of the occasions uh, out of the the last year's uh, statistics, um, there were suicides um, that happened to, to be as a result of fire, um, which is very difficult for us to, to do anything uh, with. So that does tend to put uh, a bit of a different spin on, on some of those uh, peak, but of course, any uh, fatality is you know one too many. So um, we'll work as hard as we can in, in terms of our teams right across the uh, prevention and response teams to make sure that we minimise that on every occasion. Okay. And uh, my second uh, question does relate to the um, the sickness report. Now I understand during COVID, the performance of 10 and 11 percent uh, sickness is, or average days lost, or however you want to call it, is exceptionally good. Uh, having said that, of course. We are in a situation with certainly firefighters on call. If one goes sick, only leaving three at the um, on-call station to go out, then effectively they're non-operational. Did this have some impact then on uh, slowing down the response time? The fact that we couldn't use a rural on-call station, and it took longer for uh, a retained firefighter station to attend? So throughout the whole period when um, we've been officially in the pandemic, although of course COVID is still very much out there, we've um, taken a risk managed approach in all of our activities. So if you recall back to how we even had virtual um, meetings right down to, um, so our on-call stations doing virtual training nights. So training had to continue, but in a different format. Um, it, our whole time stations and in other teams, we sort of use that bubble um, way of working to minimise contact and really to try and reduce those risks as, as much as, as possible. 
Um, so it didn't impact adversely because we tried to minimise the risks as much as, as much as we possibly could. And finally, thank you very much. It's the first report I've seen where working from home has not become an official acronym. It's uh, well stated. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any more? Surely not. Good. No. <laughs> Thank you, no, thank you very much. Well, well done. Very perceptive lines of questioning. Excellent stuff. Well done. Um, thank you, Chancellor and Stu. If we can go to the recommendation then. Sorry, Chief, anything? Uh, on page 78, which is that the 21-22 end-of-year performance report is noted by this full authority and that the 21-22 safety plan year two improvements report is also noted by this full authority. Okay. Good. Thank you. Let us move to item 12 now, which is the Fire Cadets Progress Report on page 99 of your pack. Stu, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this report um, has come forward at the request of members uh, at a previous uh, authority meeting, and I'm really happy to, to bring this uh, report forward, and hopefully this ends our, or uh, towards the end of the meeting on a, on a very happy uh, note because it's a, a, a very good piece of work and a, a real good feel-good uh, factor to it. Um, so members, some, some of the former members will re, uh, recall a report that came uh, to the authority some time ago now asking for um, the permission and also the resources to be able to expand our fire cadet scheme from a single unit that we had at Ringwood uh, to incorporate a number of units um, right the way across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, just to remind you that the Cadets Programme is, um, is a national programme. Um, it's there to support young people um, to learn fire and rescue service skills, uh, practice um, life skills, important life skills, and good citizenship. So there's a number of factors um, that, that are set out within that. Um, the report sets out the progress that we've now got a further four units up and running in, in addition to the, uh, the long-standing Ringwood uh, unit with another two planned um, already, including our first unit on the Isle of Wight, um, and we'll continue to, to, um, to progress um, with that. The Lord Lieutenant is uh, now the official uh, patron and helps to guide us uh, and raise the profile of this really good work with uh, young people across the county. Uh, and the paper sets out some of the key events uh, and also the key relationships um, that have been formed um, through this good work as the, uh, the units have been expanded across and working with other agencies and indeed other um, uh, young people groups uh, across the county. Um, there are some challenges ahead and the, the paper sets out some of those challenges in terms of uh, funding as we seek to um, provide uh, and seek um, future sustainable funding. Um, and we'll do that uh, as much as we can through sponsorship and we're working with local businesses and uh, organisations um, within Hampshire and the Isle of Wight to, to help to, to try and um, provide the resources that are required to, to be able to, to do this uh, important work. Um, so finally, uh, and I suppose in, in summary, a very short summary, um, I'm really proud, um, to the, really proud of our cadets, our fire cadets and the great job they do for us in representing uh, our organisation uh, and the beneficial programme um, that the can cadets follow, um, not just for themselves, um, but also for the service and also the community um, that they serve in terms of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight um, to help us make um, the uh, communities much safer. So happy to answer any questions and, and hopefully that gives you a, a good summary of where we are to date. Zoe. Please. Thank you. Um, and you should be proud. It is a vital piece of work and the community projects that they get involved with. Um, and I just wish to thank the staff and the 45 volunteers that actually help the, the, the cadet programme and the units take place. Um, I had the fortune of visiting um, my district um, uh, unit, which is Gosport, in the winter just gone. Um, not only did I see a drill take place, I actually um, had the pleasure of speaking to the cadets um, and asking a bit more of, of their why, why are they part of the programme. 
Um, and I'd quite like um, to sort of uh, understand a bit more of the detail of your expansion and the detail behind maybe your recruitment of the cadets, so your diversity, your economic and social background as part of that recruitment. Because part of this is measuring the real value that they do bring, and of course it is inspiring your Nick, Nick's workforce. So um, for me, uh, um, it would be great to, to understand that a bit more. But um, you should be proud. Well done. Any more? Okay. If, if we can go to a recommendation then on. Sure. Yeah. So one that just springs to mind. Carry. I'm very conscious that if this. It's fantastic work that's being done out in the community. It's brilliant. Um, there's always a great danger if you set up something and you run it and then you've suddenly you run out of money. There, is there a likely, is there a potential liability for this authority to continue further years funding beyond 2023 if that sponsorship doesn't come forward? It just so as an awareness. Yes, she is. <laughs> I've prodded her from behind. <laughs> Yeah, the, um, where we are at the moment, so the, the team are confident um, that we can, um, we can work for uh, to, to achieve sustainable funding. Um, certainly that would be having worked really hard and seen the value of our cadets, not, not just in Hampshire, but they've represented us um, at national events in London, um, at various memorial events, um, quite high profile um, uh, Remembrance Sunday um, events. So, all of those, um, all of those things, um, puts forward quite a strong case for for us to to seek um, future support from the authority. Um, should we not be successful, but my primary focus would be um, to try and achieve successful funding outside of the authority, um, and only come back if we needed to. Roger. Can I just ask a question? With the cadets, do they go outside of their own local area? Because these are very specific stations. Um, and I'll use my own one, uh, Gosport and, and Fairham. Um, do the, the recruits in Gosport go outside of that and go into Fairham and do anything in Fairham? And you could, you could use other stations the same because it's important they get around as well. So I suppose they're very similar to to how our crews operate. So they have a home station. Um, so Gosport, for example, the home station for that, um, that team. Um, but they very much do go outside and, and operate as part of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service. Um, so they, um, they visit other areas of the service. So they'll, they'll visit other, uh, other fire stations. They've been to control uh, here to get an understanding of the, broad, um, the, the broader work that we, we do. Um, they also get involved as a collective, so not just from one station, but as a collective of all our fire cadets in various different um, uh, various different events and functions. So, for example, the Recruits Pass Out Parade, um, they're there to help, in effect, with logistics and with helping us um, to organise such a, uh, an event. Um, it gives them good profile. It gets them to to see what goes on outside of uh, those sort of aspects. And like I mentioned, they've, um, they've been to other events um, in London where they come together as a wider cadet family, if you like, um, from across the UK. So there are cadet schemes in, in other fire authorities uh, across the country and they, they come together, albeit they're badged with uh, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service. Um, they come together nicely as a, as a collective. So. Um, they have a home station, but very much they're part of a, a wider and broader um, collective. Chief. Thank you. Uh, and one of the benefits of the uh, national work uh, that happens with the National Fire Chiefs Council with LGA support, of course, is that some of these schemes, including fire cadets, are nationally evaluated because it's quite important to evaluate these schemes to make sure they're adding value, as, as the point you, you've made. And certainly, uh, Princess Trust and cadets are go through a national evaluation program. And this is one of the benefits of working in a larger mass, much more data, uh, and you can actually do the comparators. Uh, so we do follow their the, the national standards around cadets as well, uh, along with safeguarding and other things which are really vital in, in doing so. So it really is a professionalised approach to supporting our young people in our communities. So. I'm really um, not only proud of what's happened locally, but proud of what's happened nationally in the, in the Fire Cadet movement. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. To the recommendation on page 106. 
which is that the progress the fire cadets project has achieved, the progress that the fire cadets project has achieved to date be noted by this full authority. Okay. <clears throat> In the excitement of the start of this meeting, when I was elected, <laughs> re-elected as chairman, thank you very much, I made a glaring omission and I didn't welcome our police and crime commissioner, Donna, to the assembly. So apologies, Good Donna. Morning. Afternoon, even. <laughs> Afternoon. Afternoon. Donna, is there anything you want to say on this? Chairman, nothing other than to say thank you for continuing to extend the invite to me. Um, incredibly useful as well to organisations, Hampshire Constabulary and uh, Hampshire, Fire, Hampshire and Alawak Fire and Rescue Service work very closely together. Um, and some good news that the Act of Parliament uh, was laid down on Tuesday of last week to formally change the name of Hampshire Constabulary to follow the good practice of Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service to include the Isle of Wight formally in the name of the Constabulary. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last item, um, which I was just going to send this out to you, but I do think it is worth mentioning in public, and that is the members' champion roles, which we have based around the tenets of governance, performance, and people. Um, uh, and in, in this, members um, deal with officers in those various areas um, to, to help them, to let us know what wording, and I am told that officers find this incredibly useful. So I just want to go through, just in case you had not remembered, uh, in, in terms of the governance area, that is Councillor Manns and Councillor Kerno Ford. Effectiveness and performance is Councillor Price and Councillor Huggins. Uh, the people, Councillor Bundy and Councillor Miller, and community safety is Councillor Harrison and Councillor Stevens. And lastly, carbon reduction and environment is Councillor Hughes and Councillor Corkery. Okay? So the plan is that you get together with your, with your uh, respective officer. And just to remind you, the governance is Neil, um, effectiveness and performance is Shantha, people is Molly Rowlands, community safety is Stu, and carbon reduction is Matt Robertson. Okay? Uh, Chief, anything to add? No, thank you. There being no further business, we close at 12.17. <laughs>